and kind of gain input. Re and they're recording it now, so we're good. Um, but um, we we took input in all sorts of forms and fashions. And, and I will tell you, it has come in over the past, like I said, year and a half through direct input at a workshop that we had at the convention center. It came in through a web page link that we had. Uh, and it has continued to come in through phone calls and emails from citizens or residents or visitors, really, that would go to Oakless Island with various inputs. Uh, just off of, you know, what we have heard, I think probably the most consistent comment has been stormwater. We've got problems with stormwater out there. Uh, today is no exception. If you go out there and see it, I haven't been on Oakless Island Day, but I'm very certain that portions of Santa Rosa Boulevard are underwater. So we, we, we respect that compounded by hurricane issues, but just heavy rains can put segments of that road underwater and some pieces are worse than others. We recognize that. Um, access and access has a several meanings to us, access to the, the, the roads that are there, the residents that are there, the condos that are there, and then access for, excuse me, access for emergency services to get down the roadway. Uh, there was severe concern the last time about, hey, if you do certain things to the road, what's it going to do for emergency services access? So we work through those issues. Um, access also includes pedestrian type facilities. Uh, and, and I will tell you, other, the other thing that we're doing is working with the city of Destin. So we kind of get an evolution of how things are changing. And one of the items that's becoming more and more popular are these LSVs, low speed vehicles or golf carts that are out there. And then blending with the roadway from an engineer's perspective, I do not find ideal. In fact, the other day I was driving down 98 and somebody was in an LSV license plate legal to be on the roadway on 98 doing about 25, 30 miles an hour. And I just don't think that's a good blend. Yes, it's legal, but it doesn't make it you know, safe. Uh, so one of the things that we wanted to look at was how can we improve access for pedestrians, joggers, uh, people with strollers, LSVs, golf carts, that kind of facility. Um, and then the other one was we want to look better. Uh, that's, a, that's always subjective. Um, I do think that if we all look at that picture that's up on the screen now, we could look better. I think we would all, from a rational standpoint, go, we can do better. What more can we do? So that was kind of the feedback that we received. Um, it was not a consensus, just do this and move on. And to the commissioner's point, when she said, uh, we, will, we, we have a blend here of all these ideas that we have come up with, just so, you're very, just so I'm very clear, this is what I'm going to recommend, what Public Works is going to recommend to the board when we present this in terms of a layout. Uh, I am certain there are going to be people who say, I, I wish you'd have done this, or man, I think this is great, but I really believe that we've kind of hit the sweet spot. I will tell you from a, an opportunity perspective, I'm very excited about the, the layout that has been developed. So... I was remiss in saying that I really thank these two for being here, Scott Bitterman, both our engineers and Jason. Thank you so much for being here, Jason Autry. The, the, the bike pathways, the multimodal is one thing I'm really excited about. As you all know, I'm all about the bike paths because we have a lot of pedestrian, a lot of people who want to use bikes. We have the bridge to bridge bike to bike path going in, but there's a proposal here and I like what I like what we've put together. I like this, I will tell you, and I hope you all do too. There's a 14 foot multimodal pass. You could push a baby carriage, you could jog, you could bike. It's gonna be a wonderful addition to the island, I think. So take a look at this and then what we'll do, we'll come back and we'll have public comments. And at 10 o'clock, no matter where we are with all the public speakers, we're gonna end. I do ask you, and I'll say this again a second time. If somebody's already said what you were gonna say, in the interest of time, yield your time to say, I agree with, I agree with what's been said. Okay. Yeah, good point. And then you, you also reminded me, the other thing is we had heard was, how is this going to work with Brooks Bridge? Um, mm. And we're going to reach out a step farther, not with the, not just the new Brooks Bridge, but with the Bridge Bridge bike path, with the boat basin, with the things that are going on in downtown Fort Walt Beach. We kind of took a, a much higher level picture than just a segment of a roadway. So uh, with that, I'll show you. This is the layout. Now we do have these on paper boards that we will bring out and stick on uh, easels here shortly, but they were a little difficult to get in because of the weather, but we'll get them in here and, and show you. Uh, and this is the first depiction. I have two figures that I'm gonna put up here. I know the scale is hard to see, uh, but the when the paper board comes out, you can get a better picture of it and I'll describe what we have here. Starting at the Santa Rosa Boulevard Inn, the most dramatic change that we're going to see in this location is Brooks Bridge and how it relates to Santa Rosa Boulevard. Brooks Bridge will no longer intersect at grade with Santa Rosa Boulevard. It's going to go right over the top of it. 
Now, underneath Brooks Bridge, you'll still have the five lanes of traffic. So there's two eastbound, two westbound, and then there's the dual left turn lane that's out there. Uh, but in large, you won't have what I have called the malfunction junction at the intersection of Santa Rosa Boulevard and US 98 and whatever the side streets are doing over there. That is a dramatic change from a traffic operations standpoint. Um, in the county, we have a couple of intersections that always create problems for us no matter what time of year it is. This is one of those intersections. Having that grade separation is a, it's a paradigm shift, quite frankly, from a traffic ops perspective. But we recognize as you move down in that area, that is where you have your greatest congestion and your, your greatest uh, collection of traffic. There's a little button on the side of your phone if you haven't done already that'll turn that off. Um, that, uh, that we need to have the maximum number of lanes possible. So what we have maintained down on the eastern end of Santa Rosa Boulevard is the five lane section that exists right now. We kind of view that as more of your commercialized type area uh, that there, I think there's some potential for growth. It ties into the convention center. It ties into Veterans Park. It ties into Marler Park. It ties into the existing restaurants that are over on the north side. It's just a real opportunity um, for growth out there. So we've left that segment alone. As you head further to the uh, as you head further to the west, we reduce it down to a four lane section for a little bit. And that goes until the first beach freeway, if that's correct, Scott. Uh, and what we have done there, and it's kind of hard to see this, but there is a, let's see if there's a laser pointer on this thing. Okay, at this location over here, which is the first beach freeway, that's no coffee right there shaking guys. Um, there, the multi-use path goes to the north back behind where Stubies is up in there, because that is where we've noticed and we've seen the, the restaurant type area. So it allows pedestrians and LSVs and golf carts, joggers, whatever, that want to go back into that area. You can get off of Santa Rosa Boulevard and be back into this more of a commercial type district. That same location is a crosswalk that goes to the south side of Santa Rosa Boulevard, which also ties into a multi-use path that will now allow you to go to the Brooks Bridge, which will have a separate pedestrian facilities from the not the foot and a half of sidewalk that's there now, and the bridge to bridge path that will go all the way to the Marlow Bridge in Destin. So you get a choice then, which way do you want to go? Do you want to go into the commercial area or the restaurant portion of Santa Rosa Boulevard or Oakless Island, or do you want to stay on the pedestrian facilities to go to other portions uh, of Oakless County, be that downtown Fort Walton Beach or even the bridge to bridge path? As you go further east, excuse me, west, so once you go from this point on, we take it down to a three lane segment and the three lane segment is two lanes that go westbound. So two lanes away from 98 and one lane going towards 98. There is not a separated median in there. So the lanes are side by side by side. And the reason we've done that is because the most delay you see are people that do not know where they're going along San Rosa Boulevard the first time they come in. So imagine the, the vacationer that's coming from out of town or even somebody visiting from the north end of the county coming down to the south end. I don't know exactly where I want to turn, but I can go along. And if I want to stay in the left lane and I know I got to turn left, those that want to continue down San Rosa Boulevard can do so unabated. There's no, no delay in that. Furthermore, without the median, we remove this constant U-turn motion that we have out there. So right now there are several condos and even our beach access ways that in order to get to them, you have to go do a U-turn and come back. Well, there's no need to have that conflict if we can get rid of that median in the middle. The advantage for us doing that is we now shift the roadway to more of a central or one side of the, of the right of way, which allows us to put in the 14 foot wide uh, pedestrian path that is separated by grass and on the boards it's very clear, but between the asphalt and the, the, the trail on the north side, you'll see there's a, 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 an open space, a green space that you can do stormwater treatment, you can do landscaping, and yes, you can put landscaping in stormwater ponds on the bottom, they actually help with consumption of water. Um, and then along the road, we are also including a bike path, uh, a, a bike lane that's four foot wide. So you have four foot wide bike lanes, and then you have three travel lanes in there, ample plenty of space for you to, to move along with vehicles, bikes that are traditionalist, uh, the hardcore bicycles that want to use the bike lanes can do so. But if you're jogging, you're pushing a stroller, you just want to have a, a leisurely bike ride or ride on a golf cart, you can get on this 14 foot wide multi-use path that anybody can go up and down without any conflict. So we feel that there's some, some solid improvement at it. The only path is on the north side. So in other words, there's not a sidewalk on the south side. That was an area that had pretty mixed reviews, but we did elect to put a singular larger path on the north side as opposed to splitting it up into two pieces, north and south. Yeah, And that's in that 
three lane section. So when you get up towards that commercial area, there will be something on both sides. But uh, once you get out of that commercialized area, um, west of the first beach park is where he's talking about yep. that it'll only be on the north. <clears throat> I think it's important to say there's no on-street parking. Uh, and that's uh, the full length of this. That's another point that had come up was there was the notion of potentially doing on-street parking. Uh, we don't have any of that. Uh, quite frankly, there's there's just several reasons. Number one of which, that's just more asphalt on the on the right of way that hurts us from a stormwater perspective. The second thing is it just was something that people were not very in favor of. And, and we understand that uh, there is not necessarily a need. We know that there's a need for parking out there at times, but putting it on the street didn't make the most sense to us. Uh, as you move further on, I think we can go ahead and look at the next slide. Maybe. Chuck, can you advance it? I, it's not clicking for me. Thank you. So this continues further to the west, and there is a point where the three lanes go down to two lanes, and I believe it's the fourth beach access way that we do that. And all we simply do is take that third lane and we have it die out in a right turn lane uh, that goes into uh, the, the north side over there on the fourth beach. Uh, there's a roadway. Do you remember which one is top of your head? Uh, Pompano. On Pompano is where it, it, it dies out. And then it's a two lane roadway from that point on, but this, the, the characteristics change a little bit of the two lanes. So before I mentioned there was a four foot wide bike lane, well, now we have a six foot wide bike lane on each side with the two lanes and you still have the 14 foot wide multi-use path and you have upwards of 27 feet, like 28 feet at the widest spot of green space between the road and the multi-use path to do stormwater landscaping or whatever features you have out there. Um, one of the important pieces of having that, it's, it, I'll get to that point in a second. So if that carries on down to the end. We did talk with Eglin as well. Uh, one of their big concerns, there's two things. First of all, there's a fiber line underground that we'll have to deal with, but we can handle that through design. Um, they've had concerns with people just running through the gate. And what they have found is people leave the commercial area, maybe not as sober as when they started, and they drive down what they see as a four lane roadway and they start thinking they're on 98. They've completely lost orientation. And what happens is they get to the end of the four lane road, which is Eglin's gate and Eglin's had a problem with that. By getting rid of the four lane swath all the way down, you increase your opportunity to say, hey, wait a minute, this isn't 98. And that's why we've actually come up with a roundabout at the very Western end of it. And this is right at that, where the park is by the El Matador. And the reason for that is, is because now when you get to there, you're going to logically say, hey, wait a minute, this is something different. I kind of got to go the other way, which Eglin is very much in favor of. Yes, there are five or six residents that do have access on Santa Rosa Boulevard. That is maintained as a two lane roadway, but your traffic volume is nothing substantial down there. So you can handle that. It's more of a secluded type of area, um, but it does help Eglin out. And at the very end of it, you'll see there's a cul-de-sac as well. So we were trying to mitigate the opportunity for people to try to zip down to the very tail end of this by seeing the roads reduce uh, and it changes out. It does not match the characteristics of 98. And when I say that, I want to be very clear. I'm talking high level, four lane, median separated roadway. If you're at night and you're not 100% aware of where you are, they could look very similar from a, from a roadway standpoint. Um, go ahead, Scott, anything you want to add? Um, Jason mentioned that it goes from three lanes to two lanes um, around the fourth beach park. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, as you get further and further west, there's less and less traffic. And so a two lane road can handle um, all the traffic that's in that area and to the west. Um, the other reason is when, when we go out and we put up signs for water over the road and that sort of thing, between the fourth and the fifth beach park is some of the areas that we notice the most stormwater issues. And so by having that extra area where we can put that landscaped median um, and it'll be a low depression area, we can get that water off the road into another space. And so um, it, it, there's a lot of competing interests. You can't have you know, a four lane highway for high speed vehicles and a pedestrian path and take care of stormwater. So those all are fighting for the same area <clears throat> and where we have the stormwater issues um, are the worst. We can also uh, have less pavement, which kind of slows the traffic down, and it also gives us the stormwater handling. Right. 
Okay, so I want to show a few of the sections um, it, it kind of covered by the zoom notice that's on there, but this is typical section EE when the paper when we put the boards out here and we'll get them out here very shortly. This is the section that is closest to Brooks Bridge, and you will see this largely represents what you have right now, except for the fact that we've added in that 14 foot wide multi use path up there. It's five lanes. Uh, the truck coming at you is in a dual left lane, but it's the same basic uh, layout that we have right now. You move down to the four lane segment and it's four lanes that are next to each other. You'll notice we're able to introduce a little bit of green space between the multi-use path and the, uh, the roadway. Uh, we are looking at curb facilities out here. I, I do want to stress that that could be an at grade curb. It could be type F curb and gutter. That's the kind of thing that will go through the design process. Uh, but we do have a little bit of separation between there. This carries on for a little bit to the next segment. And here you can really see the difference. We've shifted that path so that is off of the roadway. You've got a, a 20 foot wide landscape slash stormwater area that you can put stormwater inside of. Do not get hung up on palm trees or the shrubs that you see down in there. That is simply a, a rendering way of putting it out there. In fact, uh, I would tell you from an engineering perspective, we would not put palm trees out there because they're called non-frangible DOT frowns upon them. If you hit them with a car, the tree wins, the car loses. It's not the standard practice, which is why you see crepe myrtles commonly in the DOT right of way. It's just to depict that you can put vegetation out there. I really just, this is just a depiction at that point. Crepe myrtles would be prettier anyway. Crepe myrtles, We're in North Florida. Right. We don't want the palm trees, yeah. right? So um, go ahead. I, I was just saying it, it's not that there can't be any trees. Um, the reason that we don't want them right next to the road is we have a clear zone requirement. And depending on how wide that buffer is between the, uh, the, the multi-use path and the roadway, there may be opportunities for trees, you know, once we get into detailed design and figure out exactly how wide that space is. Yeah. But uh, it, it's just like Jason said, it's a depiction at this point. Yeah. And this is the three lane segment. If I click the button, I didn't mean to, but yeah, now we're down to the three lane segment. You can see you've got stormwater on each side, stormwater capabilities on each side, landscaping on each side. You have the 20 foot, 21 foot separation between the pedestrians, the bicyclists and the roadway. You still have bike lanes that are available at four foot wide. If you do the math across there, that is uh, 39 foot wide of asphalt. Some concern came in the past about will emergency vehicles be able to get down there? We have talked with the Okaloosa Fire District and they, they get it. There's space to move this out there. The beautiful thing about having, in this case, the bike lanes on the outside is that if an emergency vehicle is coming, you've got space to get out of the way. And clearly there's enough for the fire truck to get up or down uh, Santa Rosa Boulevard as it needs to. Uh, so we feel that, that that's good. Uh, the next segment that comes out here is you really see the benefit of no asphalt. Again, Scott made the comment before, there's competing interests. I've, I liken it to a circle that's a piece of string. If you pull one side, you can't help but affect the other. And the example I would have on this one is, if you put more asphalt down, you are negatively impacting stormwater. Conversely, if you get rid of, uh, of asphalt, and you're reducing lanes and you're reducing impervious surface, then we can improve the stormwater opportunity that's out there. So that's the, the balance that we were, we were wrestling with. Um, we did recognize that you can't do two lanes. We didn't want to do two lanes the whole way, but we also said, hey, we know the stormwater is worse on this end. Your traffic is lower on the west end. So let's, let's look at an opportunity there. Uh, again, I, I can't stress enough that multi-use path out there and the 28 feet between the edge of the, the back of curb and the edge of that, that, that pathway, that's, that's nice. That's a lot of space for, for green space and to have some advantage out there. And note the bike lanes are six feet wide in this segment. So because we reduced a lane, we actually widened out the bike lane to help with the emergency services issue and just have a little bit more space. The other thing I would tell you is that if somebody does stop to turn left and they are waiting on another car, there is space to get around. That's one of the advantages that we had out there. Don't think it'll be too high that that occurs, but it is available. And then this is the very uh, western end. So this is after the roundabout, and this is where we have about six houses that access. And quite frankly, it's largely unchanged. We'll just remove a couple lanes of asphalt. You have far more stormwater and uh, landscaping opportunity out there. Uh, and we have uh, ceased the 14 foot wide path at the roundabout. The intent is to make it from the roundabout east is where we would maintain that pedestrian access. This is this is right at El Matador where the park is, and it's only west of that where the roundabout is. So it's it's I think it was six maybe seven houses. It's not very much uh, space past that. 
Uh, and again, one of the big things that Eglin said was, if anything you could do to keep people from coming down here, we'd appreciate. It. So we felt like this was a good move towards that. Are you going to speak to traffic flow? I can't, yes, I will. So, yep. so one of the things that was very exciting is that they did a computer animation that showed that once the new uh, Brooks Bridge goes in and the light, I want you to talk about how yep. wonderful the flow of traffic is. There will not be the issue that we currently have waiting at that light. Right. One of the concerns that we had brought to us was um, traffic on, on San Rosa Boulevard. I don't want to get stuck waiting in traffic the whole time. And so what Scott did, and I'm going to give him all the credit in the world because he is phenomenal at, at running these traffic models is took information that was that's, that's readily available and counts that we had and took numbers from DOT that they used to design Brooks Bridge. And we looked at future years and we looked at our current state. So we developed a model that when we ran it, 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 it has the lane configuration we have today. And the reason we do that is we want to look at it and see, does it mimic what we see out in the field? And it, and it did by and large. We saw the backup on Santa Rosa Boulevard that can go back a pretty good ways past waterscape at times on that left turn. Um, and we did that at the peak hour. And so we felt like, all right, we've got a good grasp on the numbers here. And then what we did was we put in the new version of the Brooks Bridge and we ran various scenarios of two lanes under Santa, uh, two lanes of Santa Rosa Boulevard and four lanes of Santa Rosa Boulevard. And what we found is the improvements that we are showing and along with the Brooks Bridge, there is basically no delay outside of you could catch the light red and you wait for that signal, but you won't sit through it for multiple cycles uh, to get from Santa Rosa Boulevard to Brooks Bridge and to get from Brooks Bridge to Santa Rosa Boulevard. Believe it or not, that was the controlling movement, even though it was a right hand motion because of the way it hit a signal. So we ran those models and it could work with a two lane. But we thought, well, let's, why, why do that? Let's leave it at the five lane segment that we have down there and those reductions. Um, one of the interesting pieces that we noted about the data is when you look at traffic projections along 98, again, we looked at the year 2040. So we went 20 years out. Uh, 98's traffic does grow, but Santa Rosa Boulevard's traffic doesn't grow a huge amount. And when you step back and think about it, well, why is that? And there's certain pieces to it. First of all, there's not a lot of developable land left on Santa Rosa, on, on Okaloosa Island. Furthermore, there's restrictions in terms of what you can do. So you can't go all destined on me and build 14 stories high. We're stuck at six stories, which most of the stuff that's beachfront is that way. So there isn't an anticipation of a large density increase, which would in turn be a large traffic increase out there. Um, and that helped that model work uh, for us and for DOT as well. This picture here, uh, we've got two of these renderings and, I, and they're, they're to me very, very important to lay out. One of the things that I stressed was the separation between pedestrians, LSVs, and regular vehicular traffic. And the conflict that is created from a left turn or a right turn from a roadway across a sidewalk is one of the more common accident types that's out there. And it can occur from the car leaving the main line or from the car that's coming off of the side street. And I'll give you an example. If I'm on a road to turn left and it's a two lane road and I know I've got nobody coming this way and I'm looking this way, I may not see the bicyclist that's coming from this direction. It's a very, very common accident type. So the way that we're addressing that is by separating the, the, the uh, 14 foot wide path from the main line, you can actually get a car length between the road and the pathway. So you actually have two points of decision as opposed to one point with two decisions. It increases your odds of safety. And that car, as you can see it sitting there, is a, is a really good depiction of it. You can sit at the stop and worry about traffic and not worry about pedestrians, joggers, LSVs. Now, you could certainly have somebody in a bike lane, but you've reduced that opportunity for conflict. The same is true if you're wanting to turn left onto one of those streets. You're going to pay attention to the car coming at you. You may not see the bike, bicyclist coming down the path. Well, now you've got a snowball's chance to get through the traffic and then have to see that other vehicle on, a second, on the second side road. Um, so that separation is, to us is huge. It's, it's, it's not only stormwater, but it's a nice safety feature to have that distance between the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and, and mainline traffic. Another rendering, this shows how a crosswalk is interactive in there. Um, this is along a three-lane segment. In fact, it's specifically depicted on the boards. When we pulled out, you'll see where that is. Uh, we did have a little fun with our consultant said, make sure you put in the flashing lights. Uh, I, I literally signed the purchase order yesterday, so those are coming. Uh, they'll be installed out there. But here you can see the spacing. And so this is if you're driving down the road, you can see on the left side of the picture, you've got the 14 foot wide pathway, then you've got an upwards of 28 foot, just say 20 foot on average, 
green space that can be stormwater, landscaping, or combination thereof. You've got the pedestrian facilities to go through there. You can see how the bike lane integrates with the turn lane. Specifically, this location is where the three lane segment dies out to the two lane segment. So that one lane turns off, which is why you see the bike lane shift over. Uh, you can see how the pedestrian facilities fit inside of there. It's just a really good layout from a safety perspective. And I'm hoping that when we look at this as a group, we can all say, yeah, this, and as I said before, looks better because I think functionally it is better. I can say that from a science perspective, the looks and taste is certainly things that uh, we, we can't, I can't tell you that I know are gonna happen for sure. So uh, that's what we have on, on, on this piece of it. Um, we will be happy to bring those boards out and look at them and take questions. And I don't know, Commissioner, if we wanna start fielding some questions now and if people wanna mill around quietly on the side, they can do so, I'm, I'm open to how we wanna do it. Yeah. So I'd like to start with questions. We've given you a lot of information. I hope we you understood it. I've been able to really, really sit with this for a lot and look at it. And I'm I'm very, I th I think it's going to be a vast improvement and offers so many options for you all. I hope you like it. So if you, I'm going to start with the cards that I have. We have people on the Zoom as well. If you'd like to speak, um, you can fill out a card before or after you speak, but we do need your name and address when you come up. Make sure you press the button and uh, so everybody can hear that's on Zoom. And I'm gonna ask for Howard Wortman to come first. Good morning. Sorry you're first, it's hard. Just push the button. Alphabetical, Howard. Say your name and where you live. Howard Wortman. Oh, gosh. I'm at uh, 402 Cobia. So we are right on Santa Rosa. And one of, uh, this is really exciting, by the way. Um, my wife and I, we uh, see foot traffic and bike traffic every day. And um, we really love the idea of getting that walkway, especially having little kids. Um, we talk about stormwater. I was wondering, one of my uh, questions is, have we looked at any kind of impervious or permeable pavers or coming from New Jersey and um, the boardwalks that they have up there? Is there any way that possibly that may be something that's looked at in the walk paths or the, the pavers that are used to, to help with um, that? And that's basically all I have. I'm sure they want to sit down and listen to the rest. No, that's great. Thank um, you. Good to see you, Howard. Uh, so, uh, we have, um, in our code, we do not have a credit for using impervious blocks or pavers or that kind of thing. And the reason is what tends to happen is with the sand that we have, they blind and they act just like a concrete surface or an asphalt surface. That said, we certainly could go in with pavers, with waffle blocks, with uh, turf stones or all sorts of things. What I would say to you at this point is that is a design element we're talking about a concept. So the, the minutia of how I'm going to build this, I, I cannot take this picture, give it to a contractor and go say, go build it. Cause he would say, I don't know exactly what I'm building. And I would agree with that. So those kinds of elements would come into play. Uh, certainly our options and they weigh against all different things. First of all, the functionality, second of all, the cost. Um, you know, so we would certainly look at those types of items to have out there to improve in stormwater. For me, the biggest piece of it is anytime you can get rid of any sort of impervious surface in favor of grass, that's your best move, but absolutely something we look at. Okay, I don't know if I'm gonna get this last name right. Walt, I'm not oh, sure. Simmons. Simmons. Good. Good. Okay, come on in. Walt's good, he says he's good. Okay, good, thank you. Dave Hancock. And then after Dave, Rebecca Sherry, and then David Sherry, so you can kind of know. Dave, if you want me to take somebody else, I can. First, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. I know it's okay. Thank you. We're just glad you're here today. Uh, first, I want to thank y'all for having this meeting. Let me start over. Dave Hancock, 113 Brook Street. I own property at 909 Santa Rosa Boulevard. I want to thank Ms. Ketchell, Mr. Bitterman, and Mr. Autry for being here. I especially want to thank our engineering folks for doing such a good job. And also to make sure that people understand this is a concept. It ain't going to be built tomorrow. Because once the concept is set, then you got to do the design. And that's going to take a while, right? And 
then we go out for bids and then it gets done. So we're years away, right? It, it, it all depends. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. I'll tell you that. Um, I would also say, and a lot of people express concern of how would you do this in relation to the Brooks Bridge work. I think that is absolutely uh, a prudent, That's true. prudent how conversation. How do you think of that? So, um, but what we want to get to is a point where we have a plan, a vision of what we want to accomplish. Yep. And how know, we execute that's the next decision. You know, I've been one of the people saying we need to establish a baseline of what we're going to do and move forward. Mm -hmm. Once you establish that baseline, then we can do the design. Then we can move forward. But we've got to, you got to set a draw a line somewhere. So I appreciate what y'all have done. The one thing I would add is that if y'all can think about this later on, uh, run some power down there so we can put in some really nice Christmas decorations. The Some folks have been trying to do that and uh, solar just doesn't work. There's not enough juice. So we need a, some power there. Yeah, uh, so uh, details that have been mentioned was uh, potentially going to underground power along this corridor. You'll note we showed power poles in those segments. That is not a county decision. That is certainly one that we would talk with Gulf Power about. Quite frankly, dropping the lines into the ground is not gonna fundamentally change what we have. Uh, we do, we have talked with our consultant about the notion of putting some lighting along the pedestrian corridor, low lighting that, that kind of gives a little light out there that could have power opportunity for what you're talking about. Yeah. I just wanna emphasize everybody too about vegetation and trees. Once you set the design and get that done, then you're gonna to have to do your line of sight calculations, which when somebody lays out the angles and the, if you're sitting here at an uh, intersection, what can you see this way? What can you see that way? And that governs where those trees can be. So that's that's a long way away. I just want you to know that I have really explored with Gulf Power putting lines underneath in not just the island, but other areas. Their issue is always not putting it under, but the expense of working on the lines underground afterwards. That becomes their big rally cry every time. And we've had many discussions about this, many. I was, I, I think it makes sense in a hurricane prone area. That's what we need to do. Where I live, it is underground. And it just, you know, some developer had a vision many years ago, and that's the way it should be, in, in my opinion, in this area. But you know, I used to be in the outside plant business in the phone in AT and T, and the underground is a way to go. It is. But it people, is. it's cheap to put it up in the air. That's why they love it. Well, and it's expensive to operate once they once they put it underground. It's hard for their workers to get to it. You in California where they have all the fires? Guess where the phone lines are? Up in the air. I know. And after the fire is over, guess where they put the phone lines again? Up in the air. It's cheap and quick. Thank you. I like your idea. Thank you again. Power. I like that idea. We'll make a note of that. Rebecca Sherry. Dave Sherry's after Rebecca by request. And then Farley Street will be after Dave Sherry. Hi. Good morning, Rebecca Sherry, 554 Coral Court. Uh, I want to thank everyone up front for putting together this meeting and ask that you please put the slides or anything else you have so that we can see them afterwards so we can distribute uh, the information you shared. Um, at the August 27th, 2020 Santa Rosa Boulevard workshop, you received 162 written comments. 89% of Okaloosa Islanders and 79% of the public wrote no to reducing the number of driving lanes on Santa Rosa Boulevard from its current four lanes. Afterwards, Commissioner Ketchel, uh, you wrote, quote, we do not intend to make changes unless the majority of those who live on the island want the changes and any further action will have the majority of the will of those who call Okaloosa Island their home, unquote. Then at the January 19th, 2021 Santa Rosa Boulevard BCC meeting, 13 members of the public spoke. And with near unanimous voices, Okaloosa Islanders again told you no to reducing the number of driving lanes on Santa Rosa Boulevard. After hearing public comments, Chairman Ketchell and Commissioner Mel Ponder clearly stated they supported keeping all four driving lanes. Now on August 31st, our third Santa Rosa Boulevard meeting, um, the county again proposes eliminating Santa Rosa Boulevard driving lanes. Uh, and for the third time, I'm gonna say no. When Commissioner Ketchell spoke at the June 14th leaseholders meeting, 
She heard what Okaloosa Islanders want, fix and perhaps expand the north side sidewalk. And it looks like this design does that. Uh, we did not want Santa Rosa Boulevard reduced from four driving lanes. We did not want a south side sidewalk, south side bike path, or a roundabout. Um, Commissioner Ketchell, you told that audience that if we didn't want a south side sidewalk, you would give it to Shalimar. I say, great. Now take away two driving lanes in Shalimar and leave Santa Rosa Boulevard driving lanes alone. Remember, when asked if we wanted less Santa Rosa Boulevard driving lanes, 89% of Okaloosa Islanders responded no. 79% of the public wrote no. Then it pairs, no one listened, no means no. Most have heard the baseball phrase, three strikes and you're out. You've had at least three strikes at this plate. And with all due respect, this proposal should be called out on strikes. Thank you. Thank you, um, Rebecca. So, Jason, why don't you start? But I will yeah. say, yes, I did say those things. I will say that. But we've got a better design here. This is better. And go ahead. So um, I'm gonna, well, I look at it from a science. I don't take votes from what people think they want based on what they see out there. Uh, and the reason is largely because what we tend to do is take today's experience and extrapolate it forward without thinking about how the change may impact it. Um, as we talked further with residents uh, uh, and people that were out there using it, that comment about keep four lanes really was focused on what happens at 98. That's the, that was the greater concern of what we kept hearing. In fact, as we talked with more people that were on the Western end of it, you know, they were like, oh yeah, I'd like to be able to, to, to have that through there. The fire safety issue was one that kept coming up. But the big concern was that weight that I have as I get to 98, which is why we left that at not four lanes, but five lanes. And why we left the four lane segment in there. And then we recognized that people coming into the island needed to have that opportunity for decision making, which is why we went the three lane segment down there. From a traffic number standpoint, a two lane roadway can carry every bit of traffic that is possible to be generated on Santa Rosa Boulevard. So it's not a capacity issue. There, there's no scientific capacity reason to have four lanes of roadway. It is simply a, an ease of movement at the intersection and points of conflict, which is down at uh, 98. But you can carry on a two lane roadway, and if you want any proof of that, you can look and see what happens along uh, State Road 189 north of Baker. Their, their flow capacity on the average daily is probably at or equal to what you see on Santa Rosa Boulevard. Um, two lane roadways like Highway 20 can handle that volume of capacity. So there isn't a, a, a reason from a capacity standpoint to have it. The concern that came up next was the ability to get around a problem that may exist. That's why we put in the wider bike lanes and we put in the, the space that we have was so that if a problem came up and fire had to get to the other end, life safety had to get to the other end, they had that capacity. So we did hear people wanted to have four lanes. So what I would say is why? Give me your reason why. And just because it's there and it doesn't want to change, I don't know that I necessarily jump on to that. Uh, I would say traffic right now backs up beyond Azure. But it won't uh, so and I, when we've called you, when it's been so, a problem, you've changed the so, light cycle. So, so, so we're I already would, backing up that far. So look at the plan. You'll see it stays at five lanes to that point. We heard you. Okay. I will, I will yield the field to my, the floor to my husband, and he has another suggestion. Thank you. David. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and uh, thank you all for having this. Um, I guess, bottom line, I don't like the new plan because it looks so much like the old plan, particularly with all the lanes being taken away. And the public overwhelmingly didn't like it before, and I think that was going to hold up. But I see at least, at least a thousand cars for every bike and low speed vehicle I see combined. Yet I saw up here a multimodal path and a bike lane on each side. So two bike lanes. So the plan calls for taking two of our four driving lanes and spots and giving them up for bike lanes. And more than a thousand to one need difference and a 50-50 split in the infrastructure space, that doesn't make any sense at all. 
it's very woke in a multimodal Green New Deal sort of way, but it's also dangerous. A lot of zealots and some regulatory bureaucrats protect bike paths as if they were endangered species. They'll never let you take them out if you give our driving lanes away, no matter how bad it turns out. Even if they would let us go back, we'd waste millions of dollars in the process. Now, Jason, you said you believe in the science. I do too. I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm a scientist. I work in that field. And I believe in the scientific method. But we didn't examine what we thought was going to happen and then just implement it full scale. Okay. What scientists do is they come up with their theory, which you have, but then they test their theory and see if they're actually right. So what I would suggest is if y'all are gonna insist on imposing something as radical as taking all these driving lanes out, is that you test your theory first. So what I would suggest is you take some traffic barrels and some concrete barriers and you block off all the lanes you're gonna get rid of and try it out. At least if it goes wrong, you only have the tourists and the locals spitting nails for a year instead of from now on. I can't imagine what peak season will look like, but at least it won't be permanent. It'll cost a lot less and we can get rid of it if it doesn't work. Better still, listen to the people. We're the ones that are gonna to have to live with this decision. The public spoke repeatedly 80% plus say four driving lanes work and don't mess with it. Yet we're here again, like we're in the movie Groundhog's Day, getting rid of traffic lanes. Either staff's not listening to the commissioners or some of the things I heard at that January 19th BCC meeting um, just were um, all talk. But um, I feel like the $100,000 we spent is so much like the first set of drawings, the, the 100,000 that was approved at the January 19th BCC meeting ended up with something that was so much like what we had before. I think the $100,000 was essentially um, a waste. And, you know, I, I don't think, and, you know, you talk about what the people want, that's what government of the people, by the people, for the people is supposed to be about. The people aren't too stupid to understand what you're talking about. The people do understand completely and believe that eliminating driving lanes on Santa Rosa Boulevard is just a horrible idea. I'm glad you have money to spend along Santa Rosa Boulevard, but spend it on the north sidewalk. Spend it on burying those power lines. Um, but the public supports both of those things, and it would harden the the power lines thing would harden our infrastructure in addition to looking better. Again, thank you for having this, but. I really think reducing the traffic lanes is a bad idea, but try it out if you think you're right, but don't do it permanent. Dave, let me just say that we did scientifically use, we did a computer animation with the new traffic signal and with Bricks Bridge and the traffic is reduced. I mean, there's just nothing. There's no reason to have four lanes unless you can tell me why. Are you concerned because you wanna go faster than the other person? Is that the issue? I mean, tell me what it is. I, I sincerely want to understand. And it's not till the very, it's almost to the middle. So most of the traffic dissipates until you get down to the El Matador. So what is the issue? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. The, the issue is I, I, I am a scientist and an engineer and, and I, I've written computer models. I understand computer models completely. And it can be garbage, it can be good, it can be garbage in, garbage out. And I can also tell you, you can make a computer model say any darn thing you want. I, where the rubber hits the road, on the ground, if you're right, put the barrels up, put the concrete barriers up. If, you know, that's actually gonna prove in the real world what's gonna happen. I mean, for years, people thought that heavier objects fell lighter or fell faster to the earth than light apt objects until a guy named Galileo got up in the Tower of Pisa and started dropping things and found out everybody was wrong the whole time. And if they'd written a, a, a computer model based on that, the computer model would have been wrong too. But how hard would it be to try this out 
before you go down this road. That's that's all I'm saying. I think it's the prudent thing to do. It's not like the Brooks Bridge is going to be done tomorrow. Give if, if you if you want to try it, try it, but don't do it before you've tried it. Thank you. Thank you. Louise Erickson. Louis, I'm sorry. Louis Erickson. I'm sorry. Morning, Lewis Good Erickson, uh, 1110 Santa Rosa Boulevard, where I live at Waterscape. Uh, I'd like to thank Jason and Scott for all the hard work that they've done uh, to put this together. I'd just like to add my voice that, that I love this plan. Uh, you did take into account the considerations of the four lane traffic where it was needed, the, uh, the emergency vehicles getting passed even on the, on the two lane area. And keep in mind that very few people have access to a fire truck that's just two miles away. <laughs> um, uh, David Sherry, the Sherry's mentioned some of the things that were said in the last meeting, and they're not wrong, but they didn't mention things that Nathan Boyle said about the fact that um, uh, four lanes for the few houses at the end is just ridiculous. That is, that is ridiculous. Uh, and that leans credence to what you were saying about what people can envision when they said, we don't want to lose our four lanes. What exactly were they talking about? Were they really talking about four lanes over there by the base where no cars actually go? No, they must have been talking up the areas that we see. And I live in Waterscape, so I live in the problem area. I, I have trouble turning out of, of my driveway or of the you know parking lot uh, in, in that traffic. And so... I appreciate what you did. Um, the, the computer models, uh, I find it really hard to believe that you guys set it up based on your own personal opinions. Uh, I appreciate what you said about the fact that you tested it, your model on what is here today to see, do we see what currently happens so that we can know that our future projections are good. Uh, you know, I, I'm, the Sherry's numbers I'm sure are correct. Uh, with the percentages that said that, but I'm curious now with an actual vision, if we sent it out, what kind of numbers we might get showing what you've done. And I don't think this is the same as the concept. The concepts were roundabouts, potentially three lanes, four lanes. This is specific. This is four lanes here. There's one roundabout at the end. It is, it is definitely uh, different. As far as the, the, the people and, uh, you know, the, they're, they're, I like to say this about the United States, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. And we understand the tyranny of democracy, the tyranny of the 51% uh, uh, doing it. So I'm not so sure that you would get the negative response if you did it again now with a vision and reasoning behind it. And if it's important to the commissioners, maybe we could do another referendum or something. I, I don't know that it is, but if, it, if you wanted to get that feedback again, I don't think you'd get the same no numbers now that you have an actual plan. I don't want to take too much time, but I, I love the plan from beginning to end. Thank you. Lewis, before you... I like what you said, because I did say those things about four lanes until I saw the computer model, which was watching Galileo drop the balls and they were equal. And I went, oh, wow, they're equal now. I mean, it was just wonderful. When I saw what happened, I realized we didn't need the four lanes because we could go around vehicles and we were able to put in the woke pedestrian park. I'm sorry, I, that, that term drives me crazy and I'm not, I don't consider myself woke, but I think it's wonderful to have bike paths that are safe for children. I mean, I've seen a couple of people holding children here. It's wonderful. We want those things out there. So family friendly. Craig Grossland. Uh, good morning, Craig Grossland. I live on uh, 801 Tarpon Drive, uh, my first meeting. So I haven't, uh, been a resident out there for very long. Uh, first off, just uh, again, thanks for all the hard work. Uh, I really like the plan. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to ask about. Uh, first off, I'll just put on the record, my vote is I support the uh, reduction in the lanes, especially as a West End Edge president in favor of water management in that area. I think you're on point on that. Uh, next point is the tie-in. I, I have, uh, my house is frontage to Santa Rosa Boulevard. So I was curious about the tie-in of the 14 foot bike path to the property lines of the residents, uh, especially where I am, there's a great difference. Uh, so uh, there's a problem with uh, erosion uh, from my property onto the, onto the uh, sidewalk and a lot of uh, uneven surfaces on the sidewalk there. 
And then the third thing I wanted to ask, maybe it's not in this meeting, but the, um, the uh, what do you call it? The, the sound side parks, those, those water accesses, yes, is so that gonna be addressed or if there's any, uh, okay. you know, anything about those? We're not, uh, we're not touching the water okay. access ways. I so, hesitate to say that after saying <laughs> the four lanes, but yeah. we are not. Okay. So I, I, mean, I think I can answer that. What you asked about with the grade and how that ties in, that is a detail that we would have to figure out through construction. Um, what I would say in a general perspective is if you have an existing driveway, an existing connection, existing fencing, and it ties to it, we work with every piece of that uh, to make sure that there's as minimum impact as possible. There are times where the work we're doing will affect something five, 10 feet away, and we will work with that individual property owner on how we address that. But I can uh, absolutely assure you, and if you, I can, I'll, I'll go ahead and put my name on it, on the PG Adams widening, which is a substantially greater effort than what we're talking about on this. We work with every resident to make sure that it is the, 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 base, the best thing for them. So I don't know how we would tie to it, but what I could tell you is that we would certainly account for any grade differential and matching of what's out there. Mm -hmm. The other, the good part about having that green space between there is that we showed a straight a sidewalk or multi-use path, there's always the ability to meander to some degree. A foot here and there can make all the difference in the world. So we would work on each of those individual units. Is that path going to be up to the property line or is there no, going to be a setback a, or something like we, that? We had a space. I saw, I saw a little green space. Yeah, we had a space there. between there for just that kind of yeah. issue. Um, and the other thing is if you put the path, the edge of it up against something, you in effect get rid of the outside foot of availability because people tend to drive away or walk away from an obstacle like a fence or something like that. Okay. So yeah, that there is intended to be a space there. Okay. Uh, in terms of the sound side, oh. I ain't touching that with this project. Okay. That's about the most Southern way I can say it. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you. Ray Valdivere? Um, Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Ray Valverde, I live at Island Echoes. The one thing I see with the one lane that no one's talked about is the people that are coming out of the condos to merge into the one lane when the, when the heavy traffic is going. You're going to have people backed up in the parking lots trying to get to the one lane to get out at, the, at, at critical times when people are all mass exodus. I've lived there for 10 years. And when everybody checks out at one time, guess what's going to happen? Every, condo, every uh, condominium along there, people are going to try to get in one lane. That's what you're not considering. It can be smoothed all the rest of the time, but when everybody checks out of those condos, which I'm one of the very few that live there full time at the condo that I'm at, the rest of them are vacationers. And how in the world are you going to get 20 cars going out in mine, 20 cars in this one, 30 cars in this one, the bigger the condo, the more cars you're going to have merging onto that one lane. It's not going to work with so, one lane. So they all check out on what, Friday morning? Or it's a variety Sunday, now that Sunday. COVID hit. It used to be pretty much Sundays. Sundays. But I'm telling you what, or at dinner time, when people want to go to dinner at five o'clock, I see the same thing happen. I know how to go around it because I've lived there for so long. But it, you're going to have a problem with one lane going out. When all these, when all these condos, people are leaving uh, to go home. You're not taking that into consideration. I'm telling you. One lane, fine, when it's just normal. But when people are leaving uh, their vacations, for me and everybody else that lives there full time, it's going to be a pain. So that's what you're not considering. Thank you. It, so when you look at a, a driveway on a, on a two-lane roadway, and that's what we're talking about, I think, Louis, you said a second, you said your driveway, your, your parking lot driveway is still a driveway. Um, there is the expectation that you'll have to stop for, for oncoming traffic. And I'll again say the volume capacity on a two lane roadway. And as you go further west, you have less capacity potential that you might have to wait. But we have looked at it's not excessive. It's not it is not the, the driver of, of this out there. I, I understand. As they check out. They're going east. I understand. I no, I that. totally understood. You're talking about a right turn out of your driveway. Correct. Yes, I understand. And how are you going to get all those condos going out at one time that they don't back up inside the parking lot of the condo that get people upset trying yeah. to get out? So and you're going to have people like they do in Desk when you're trying to go around. We're, we're just going to have to disagree. I, I just, I don't agree with you. I, I do not foresee that as a problem. Why How about that? You see what I'm talking about when people are Explain why. It's because be the traffic flow will continue. 
I, 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 the reason he disagrees <laughs> is that traffic flow will not back up with one lane, even though it sounds like it will, because there won't be the stop at the light. Isn't that what backs people up? Not where he's talking about. That light won't have the yeah. effect. It just, it's just. Yeah. I'm talking when you leave it and go east and go back home yeah. on 98. Well, that's Those, something we, all we might need to do. You, you, can, you can look at any two-lane roadway. Any two-lane two right? It's a two-lane roadway. So that means one lane in each direction. That's a two-lane roadway. Okay. I'm, I don't know any other way to say that. Okay, but you're going to have one lane going each, right? That's correct. In a okay, two-lane right. roadway, one lane goes each way. Which condominium do you live? Where? Island Echoes. Say it again. Island Echoes. Island Echoes. I'm going to look into it. I want to. I want to. We see certainly can put it in there, but I, I do not foresee that as a problem. We certainly will take a look at that further. Rick Bradford. Hi. Good morning, Rick Bradford, 439 Cardinal Avenue, Oakley Island. It's good to be in your company. I appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, especially since uh, we met last uh, with the uh, oil meeting at the convention center. Uh, I, uh, I was looking to uh, the four lane commitment. I confess looking at the proposal today, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by it. I think that, uh, the, that, for example, the last gentleman that spoke has a legitimate uh, complaint uh, despite traffic modeling and everything that you may know. Uh, I've got a video here I'd like to show you of uh, 15 buses that make an annual trek down here with a, however many uh, young people are that fill up those buses and then they take up one whole lane eastbound on Santa Rosa Boulevard and what that looks like. May I show that to you? So what, what I want to have a look at it, but I'm not in favor of designing a road to a an annual occurrence um right so so Yeah. So again, I, I get it. There, there are times where somebody could go down with 15 buses of, of whatever, but I, I just, we don't design to one. I'll give you a better example. We don't design uh, building roadways, housing structures to a category five hurricane. We don't do it. We, you can't do it. It's unreasonable. So if we're, if we're going to look at what the most logical practical thing to do is, is you're going to take what your normal circumstances and in fact you peak it to a degree but you don't take that one-off annual buses go down this roadway so i appreciate that happens and i would go this far to tell you uh eglin parkway is six lanes seven lanes out here and when i drove in it was stopped so uh, you're gonna have instances i completely understand that what we're trying to do is come up with something that that addresses, I'm gonna go 80, 90% of the time of, of what you got, probably higher percentages of that in terms of traffic. So um, I, I certainly can appreciate it. I, I do think that if you've got an instance where uh, some entity, a condo or group of condos has 15 buses of, 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 of students, kids or whatever it is coming along, maybe they need to find a way to accommodate that on their property. I don't disagree with that sure. and that would be nice. Sure. And this is not just the one off, this happens at various locations further west than what I share with you as an illustration. Sure. The second thing, uh, and, and that validates to me the point that the previous gentleman that spoke made. One lane is difficult, is made more difficult, more challenging, which is what that video demonstrates. And it does happen further west than the location I took this particular video uh, two and a half months ago. The second thing is, and as I shared with you guys when I met with you in, in, in January, uh, I have observed 40 foot tractor trailers going all the way down to the Air Force property and then having to make that turn because they don't know where they're going. Yes. And then as a boat owner with a 36 foot trailer, it is, and I'm further west 
uh, it's difficult to make that right turn onto the narrow roads that we have. And, uh, and, and, that is, and it requires that I make a right turn from the number one lane, which doesn't make me uh, very friendly to the people who are stopped on the right side as I navigate that. And I'm not the only boat owner, and I've shared that with you as well. Those are the considerations that I see as challenges still with this model. And I've not heard from the chief of police, uh, the, the fire chief, but I know that the position from them, at least up until now, and perhaps that they heard something different from them has been a challenge. Yeah, so the semis, that's why we put the roundabout at the back end. Mm -hmm. uh, that would allow for a semi, somebody with a boat to make a, a turn on space that is currently not available. Uh, I would also tell you that um, if you're talking about turning on to the current road as it sits now, you basically are turning on to two lanes, whether it's east or west, whichever direction you're pulling on to. You might have the width available to you, but the two lane segment we have is actually wider than any of the two lanes that currently exist. So it should be a little bit easier to navigate. Um, I certainly do appreciate the, you know, now you've got, you know, two different flows of traffic to get out there. Um, but uh, from a from a turning movement perspective, it, it should be more uh, manageable, quite frankly. Yeah, <clears throat> when you add the, the bicycle lane width plus the curb and gutter section width, you've almost got a full lane width worth of um, space that's not always used. And so when you make that turn, it's almost like you're making a turn out of the left turn lane with that extra space. So the bicycle lanes and the curbing, it, it serves multiple purposes, it allows people to get over and let fire trucks by It allows people to make easier turns. And so it, it's, it has a lot of functionality. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Danica Cano. Hey, I'm Danica Connell, 1110 Santa Rosa Boulevard. Um, that's, that's at Waterscape also. Um, I would like to agree with the comments that Lewis said earlier. I am in that busy section. I have seen the traffic models that um, have gone behind this, um, and I'm an engineer as well. And I agree with the models that I've seen. It is exactly, um, the models that I saw model exactly what I see on the roadway. So I appreciate y'all's work. The rest of our neighboring communities are moving forward and Santa Rosa Boulevard definitely needs an uplift or we're going to be left behind. Um, the people turn out for the meetings are often in opposition. And I would just like to let you know that for every one person here that's in opposition, there are a thousand other condo owners that would love to see these changes. I am a biker myself. And another comment was made this morning that there are a thousand cars per bike, and that is because our bikes will not fit on the sidewalk. Two bikes cannot pass on the sidewalk. So um, I'm really looking forward to these changes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. It makes me happy all the applause. Thank you. We've all worked so hard on this, and we're trying to do the right thing by everybody, and it's very hard. We're not going to please everybody. Um, now I'd like to go to some of our Zoom participants. Do we have anybody that has called in that wishes to speak? Matthew? Yeah, we can't see it. Barber. I think. It's a Matthew Barber. Matthew Barber. Matthew, can you hear us? He's muted. He's on. If, if you're still on, unmute. If not, we'll go to the next caller. Okay, we'll go to the next caller. Uh, doesn't have a name. Has a telephone number there? Looks like they're still muted. How about how about Bill? Can they can they raise hands, Chuck, to see? If they've raised, then all right. Then. Yeah. Then okay. Back up. Yeah, Matthew Barber. If you hear us, you're muted. You've muted yourself. You've got to unmute yourself yeah. on your end. His hand's down now. Okay, how about Bill? You watch, they're all gonna start talking at the same time. Yeah. Okay, how about Cecil Jones? Is that somebody who wishes to speak? Raise your hand if you know how to do that. I hope you do. Isn't that Chuck in the bottom middle under the options, there's a raise hand? 
Okay, That's right. Okay. I think it's under the more options where it comes up. There. Okay. I don't know if there's anybody else. I don't know if there's anybody else. Is there anybody in the audience that wishes to speak? You can fill out your card after. Just state your name and address. Um, my name is Carmen Parker. I live on Selfish Drive. Um, the letter, the note I sent you was asking the question about eastbound traffic. Um, eastbound traffic should move faster and smoother once the bridge goes in, because if I'm not mistaken, at the bridge, there's going to be almost like a clover leaf. So you're going to have continuous movement. Um, there's not going to be a red light stopping traffic, the link that there is now once the bridge is in place. And I'm assuming most of these upgrades are not going to happen until that point. Um, I would like to ask a question. Um, is the infrastructure, sewage and water, going to be replaced at the same time that Santa Rosa is updated? Um, kind of important because we have a lot of water leaks on Okaloosa Island. Um, that, and I would also like to suggest some form of trees in that green space, only because of the shade that they provide during hot summer months. Other than that, I like the plan. I'm excited. I'm just glad we have a plan. Am I a little disappointed that there's not going to be sidewalks on both sides? No, but a 14 foot space will be extremely nice. And then all the reasons why you did that make perfect sense. Um, thanks. So I'm thank excited. You. Thank, thank you, Chuck. I'm going to make your life really difficult. Can you get back to the PowerPoint presentation? Because there is one slide that I had tagged on the back end of that that shows Brooks Bridge, which would allow me to kind of illustrate what you had had. Um, in terms of the water and sewer infrastructure, I uh, will talk with my counterpart. Um, that's the picture right there. I'll talk with the water and sewer director, Mr. Luttrell. Uh, I am sure they would be champing at the bit to idea. have an opportunity to mix. It, while we're tearing the road up, let's do it once. I agree. <laughs> that, that's that's very possible, um, but we will certainly work with them on that. So uh, to refer back to the, the Brooks Bridge aerial that's in here, and that's exactly the one right there. Uh, and I'm going to, and for those on Zoom, I'm sorry you can't see me do this for those in the audience. Bit. To orient everybody, this right here. Oh, Chuck. This is where a guy operating the computer needs three hands. So this is Santa Rosa Boulevard. This is US 98. And anywhere that it's gray is an elevated structure. That means bridge. It's not touching the ground that, that we will walk on. So you can see that Brooks Bridge comes in and it does not hit ground. And by ground, in this case, it's actually elevated fill on an MSE wall. So kind of like when you go under an interstate, there's the bridge itself, but right next to it, you have a 20 foot wide, a 20 foot high wall that's got ground behind it. Santa Rosa Boulevard goes underneath Brooks Bridge through here. If you are, and I'm going to give the different motions that you experience on here, you're coming from Fort Walton Beach, you want to go off of the Brooks Bridge, you take a right, you have your own lane that, that dies off of Brooks Bridge into the Santa Rosa Boulevard access road. You go through this roundabout, and that's where you hit your first signal, which the timing on it is cycles much faster because you are only dealing with Santa Rosa Boulevard to where you decide if you're going left or right. We've run the model on that. You do not get a two cycle backup in any way, shape or form in any direction. If you are on the Brooks Bridge, excuse me, if you're on Santa Rosa Boulevard and you wanna to go to Destin, you take a right through here, go through the roundabout and you take a right and go out through there. And it's almost unabated. You do go into a two lane traffic. So kind of like you were talking earlier about pulling out of a parking lot onto a one lane. This is the same sort of concept. You're taking a right turn onto the two lane roadway that, that moves along, which is the traffic on 98. If you are going on Santa Rosa Boulevard and you wanna to go to Fort Walton Beach, you go underneath 98 through the roundabout. At, the existing roundabout will be enlarged at uh, Marler Park through a new access road that currently is that gray and green hotel. It will go through there and you have a right lane that slides onto the Brooks Bridge on a dedicated lane. In other words, that lane starts where you enter. There is no traffic coming through it. You'll have free flow access onto Brooks Bridge and then you can carry on to, um, you can carry on to Fort Walton Beach that direction. If you're coming from Destin and you wanna get onto Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa Boulevard, you actually have a couple options. One of them is you can take a right, go through the roundabout and go this way. 
or if you so choose, you can come here and take a left. There will be a, a single metered lane through that point and you can turn left and now come down here. This way is a little bit shorter, but you have to sit through a left turn light. You can decide to take the right turn and just kind of slip right on through with perhaps a little bit less timing on it. So you have two options to come in that direction. So that should answer all the, the directions of flow into and off of Santa Rosa Boulevard. Again, the most dramatic difference is the bridge is over Santa Rosa Boulevard. It, it com that, that element alone changes how we're able to um, handle Santa Rosa Boulevard traffic. So let's talk a little bit about timeline because everybody's thinking, is this going to happen in a year or two? And my understanding is that Brooks Bridge, they're going to begin work about September or August of next year. You know those is numbers that, off the top of your head? Is that correct? Two yeah, down. go two slides down, Chuck. Now, again, we threw a whole bunch of stuff in there. And we say that there. with, you know, FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation can change that schedule, but that's what they're telling us. Yeah, so around. here's some of the numbers. You know, they've got $184 million for right-of-way acquisition and construction, and the construction is going to start towards the end of 2022 calendar year, and they're thinking it'll last about four years. Um, we're pretty optimistic that they won't have Skanska out there with their barges, so we won't have that sort of delay introduced. Uh, that was supposed to be somewhat funny, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it is a four-year project, and what they'll do is they'll build a new bridge, tear down the existing, this is going to sound funny, tear down the existing two bridges, believe it or not, Brooks Bridge is actually two bridges, and then they'll put the, the other new bridge where the existing bridges are. So they've got a a lane shift pattern and, it, and it, it is extensive and it um it will be um growing pains did we lose our computer chuck oh we had a power flicker uh, yeah we had a power flick i saw it <laughs> yeah so uh come on up if you would come up state name. your name and address for the record sorry matt, matt turpin 224 yacht club drive but i do own property in the island as well at uh, 1328 miracle strip parkway has it been addressed what bucket of funds these uh, as a mixture of funds, whether it be TDD, uh, county half cent sales tax, how this would be how this would be paid for? Yeah, so I, I wonder when that question would pop up. Uh, how are you gonna pay for it? How much is it? Right. Um, the answer to what you asked, Matt, is is yes. As you're on the surtax committee, there are surtax funds that are identified towards this. I would certainly look to use all sorts of funds that are available, TDD funds, surtax funds. I would even reach out to DOT and find out if there's other alternative traffic funds we could use for that conceptually our number sits on this at about the 10 million dollar number uh, i would tell you that has the potential to swing in any direction uh first of all timing of construction costs uh what all we decide we want to put into it if we do embark upon putting uh and i'm going to make extremes if you add in replacing water and sewer costs go up if you add in underground power if you add in doing alternative uh, uh or uh, as dave asked for um you know power outlets along with those things could impact costs the amount of landscaping, the type of landscaping that you put in, all of it goes in there. But if I'm going to give you an order of magnitude number, I'd say $10 million is where I'd start with. Now, what I wanted to also talk about, not just the Brooks Bridge, but then when would we actually begin to do the work on Santa Rosa Boulevard so that everybody in the audience kind of has a sense for that? Right. So I made the comment earlier, and I wish I could remember who asked it. Uh, I said, of all the things that we factor in, I think, Dave, it was when you were speaking, you know, we would have to factor in other things like when do we do this construction related to Brooks Bridge? Uh, I do not want to be the tail that wags the dog in terms of the construction process. I would say Brooks Bridge needs to carry on its plan because it is a far more extensive project than what we're talking about out here. However, if there's the opportunity while well, they've got half of Santa Rosa Boulevard torn up while they're putting a bridge in, why don't we do the construction there? Because nobody will really notice the difference. Um, I do think it would be a mistake to do all of it at all the same time, perhaps. I don't know. I'd have to get some plans that show me the details of what it would look like. Uh, so using that as a, as a reference, I don't think you would see construction begin on this until the Brooks Bridge construction began, which we just pointed out. It's about a year and three months away. Um, but we've got some plans to develop and, and some things that I'm going to have to learn before I come back to the board and recommend this is the timeline I would have. Uh, I would say to anybody that's out here, one of the things that Scott and I pay attention to and the phone calls we get relates to the impacts of our work, whether it's construction, maintenance or otherwise on the traveling public. I don't know if any of you had the luxury of driving across the railroads work that they did on Antioch Road a couple of months back. We didn't do any of it and we got all the phone calls. We're keenly aware when there's a problem on the roadway. So uh, we pay attention to how this affects uh, traffic movement that's out there. One thing that I would say is unfortunately there is no way to just do this in the off season. This is too much work to do in the off season. It's too extensive, but we could find ways to perhaps mitigate the impacts. 
thank you. So that's good. So that kind of puts that in your mind about, you know, you're looking at probably sometime after 2022. Uh, Vince Bruner. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Vince Bruner and uh, I live over on Elk Club Drive and own property on the island at 573 Santa Rosa Boulevard. Um, I want to congratulate you on a wonderful, well thought plan and uh, uh, the vision and reasoning behind it, uh, the plan and the science and the computer models are, are really uh, amazing and, and give people who are scientists and engineers in our audience uh, uh, an opportunity to really dig in and, and uh, grasp exactly what's going on. Um, I'm a, a liberal arts major and a lawyer, so I don't quite uh, subscribe to all those kinds of reasoning, but uh, it sounds wonderful being able to keep the four lanes and now even five lanes uh, that you've done uh, to address the concern to people who were uh, both for, uh, for it and against it before. And um, then uh, presenting this in, in such a wonderful uh, display, it gives people a time uh, to look over it who maybe had uh, reservations and, and concerns, which you've tried to address. And maybe now we can have some time to look over it and as a group, uh, get our teeth into it and and uh, and to understand exactly what you propose, but to have uh, educated, uh, trained professionals uh, to be able to do a job like this. And I was listening to what Dave said. He said the public is uh, fully aware and uh, completely uh, grasped everything. Well, I agree with the public is aware and the public is knowledgeable, but I don't know that Dave that I think that we ever completely grasp everything that government is privy to and has information on and, and the uh, education, uh, the training experience that you guys have had over many years. And, and maybe given some time, we can take a look at this and digest it more and more and really um, uh, you know, get our uh, uh, arms around it and embrace it. Um, the uh, water management improvements are, are huge and, and they outweigh a lot of so-called negatives if there are some and i believe that as people get a chance to see all these wonderful presentations computer models and slides that they're going to like it more and more because i think it it really brings us into a modern era and uh, takes us out of a, a time that is, is kind of coming on and things change so, uh, Mr. Bitterman, Mr. Autry, I want to commend you on a, just an absolutely wonderful plan. I hope you guys will remember in the landscaping how important shade is and how nice it would be to be able to have a, a nice shaded area out there and being able to be so pedestrian friendly and so bicycle friendly and so children friendly and safety conscious. Those are some huge improvements uh, and uh, just want to thank you for all that. Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, every once in a while we have a utility who decides to go out there and dig up half of all the grass that we've got planted in order to add a new uh, uh, phone line at, uh, at uh, uh, Villa Capri. And, and they just dig it up and just walk off and leave it. And it looks like the Dickens and you just, you're scratching your head going, well, they've got a right to do that. But maybe there's a chase or something that we could put in that everyone could have access to and say, okay, we're not going to keep doing this. And you're going to, you're going to have better control over what they do and, and how they, they do that, because this is a, a, a tremendous opportunity. And I think that that we'll all uh, have a better chance to get our teeth uh, into it and our arms wrap our arms around it and, and understand it better as we have some more time because it's so, it's so uh, ingenious and it's going to take a little while to to really uh, grasp it. But uh, hope you'll keep that in mind and thank you very much for all your hard work. And thank you for coming and and for those of you who don't know, he was not he's not only a resident and a business owner out there, but he's also a state senator. So when he talks about the complexities of government. <sighs> He understands it's very complex and there's a lot of different moving parts, but I really believe in the science of this and I think they've got it nailed and I'm, I'm so excited to go forward with it and I love the idea of the water sewer at the same time we're going to be on that right away. Thank you very much, Senator. So I know we're, and I don't want to close, I'll let you do the close yeah. up, but I know we're close to the tail end of it. Scott did get the boards that are up there. I do have a little bit of time that actually I can hang around and point some things out up there, especially since we have lost uh, the internet on the outside world, which is about the most liberating. Uh, we haven't lost the internet, Never mind. Uh, but I'll be happy to, to kind of share the thoughts we have out there. I do want to go back to what I said in the beginning, and, and I think some of the comments and the, you know, the, the applause meter that's been out there echoes that. We put together, and, and I got to give Scott a tremendous amount of credit because 
and he and I are generally on the same page, but there are times where we, we kind of clash and we think about what's the best way to get out of this. We put together what we feel is, is a solid plan and a vision and a concept, right? Um, we recognize, in fact, just yesterday, as we stood there looking at the boards, the very question I asked staff was, tell me a reason why we don't like this. We wanted to find the things that we didn't like. And we had some things that were said here today, a couple of things that we didn't say. So that's why we elicit the input. Um, but I, I fully recognize there's no way I'm ever going to get this entire room all on the same page and go, we love every aspect of this. I get that. I get that. Um, so one of the things that, that I get to do or have to do, depends on what the circumstances are, is this is the one that I would recommend and here's why. And so I appreciate, Vince, what you were saying about there's a lot that happens back behind that the government has. I don't want you to take that as a moment of a lack of transparency. No. If you want to know why, I'll tell you why. Uh, in fact, I have a saying in the office, do not ask me a question for which you may not want to hear the answer, because I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly why. And it's the logic that I have, and we may not be on the same page with it, but we feel like this is the best thing, which is why I started off by saying this is what I'm going to recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that we move forward with. There's a lot of things we still got to work out. I recognize that as well. There's a lot of details. How am I going to tie to your your dry, your, your, your fence line with the, with the sidewalk that's there? How are we going to make all the driveways work? How are we going to make the swale work? What kind of trees are we going to put in? How are we going to deal with electrical? How are we going to deal with the, the water and sewer? All of those things are absolute details that we're going to work on. We're at 30,000 foot. I'd like to bring the plane down a little bit closer to see what more we detail we get onto. And I won't do that in a bubble or a vacuum either. Y'all are welcome to have that input and see where we're going with it. And I will always tell you why. I've never done it and said, just trust me. Um, <laughs> reminded me of an old joke on that one. Uh, but uh, you know, that's where we are with public works. Uh, I, I appreciate it. They said the kind words and the work that we put in on it. Uh, I, I speak a lot, but I got to tell you, I couldn't do it without the engineering team. Scott Bitterman um, has been an absolute blessing for me every year when we talk about things are going on. I say, you're not leaving me, right? Because he does fantastic work and, uh, and our design team as well. Um, they did a great job with this project. Genesis Half is the, is the company that did it. We'll be here to answer questions if there's any more that you've got. And, and I appreciate the, the input. And I, if nothing else, this shows evolution of a project. That's right. right. That's right. So I really do want to thank Scott Bitterman and Jason Autry for their time this morning, for the work they've put into this. We have worked hard behind the scenes. I want to thank Ted Corcoran for being here from the chamber, our surtax committee members that have been here today, for all of you for coming today and giving us ideas, uh, water sewer, uh, Ray Barati, did he leave uh, his idea of, you know, we got to look at that with uh, the, the traffic flow, I'm, gonna, I'm really taking that serious, the shade, uh, we're going to look at the shade trees and so forth, we'll continue to make improvements. Yes, I did say we weren't going to take away the four lanes, but we've got a better product. We've got something that's going to work and you can go around people. You don't have to sit. You can turn, you know, you can go around them and pass them on the right hand side when they stop. So I'm very pleased about this design. I think we've got we finally hit a good place with it. Thank you all for joining us. We are going to have the boards here. We'll be here to answer questions for a little bit. Really appreciate you coming out in this awful weather. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me, 850-651-7105. Thank you. The meeting is adjourned.